Straight Ahead on Law & Crime Daily. The Parkland School Shooter Penalty Phase Trial. Did you ever learn that Linda was ever fearful in her own home? Yes. A closer look at the gunman's relationship with his adoptive mother. And hear from the gunman's middle school principal. Do you know any administrators at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? Yes, I do. Did you have any contact with any of them when he No, I did not. There? I feel very guilty about it. Plus, when he calmed down, he was, you could see he really, really was apologetic about what he did, almost like it was another person that had done it. Did this defense witness hold up on the stand? And later, I am very sorry for what I did, and I have to live with it every day. And that if I were to get a second chance, I would do everything in my power to try to help others. Just months after making this apology, the gunman creates disturbing drawings from his jail cell. Law and Crime Daily, covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome, everybody, to the Law and Crime Daily. I am your host, Imran Ansari, in for Brian Buckmeyer. We begin with this show with a review of week six in the Parkland School shooting penalty phase trial. On February 14th, 2018, a then 19-year-old gunman opened fire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. 17 people were killed and 17 more were injured. In October of last year, the gunman pleaded guilty to all charges. That means a Broward County jury will now decide whether he receives life in prison or the death penalty. This week marked the second week of the defense's case as the gunman's attorneys largely focused on his rocky childhood. Defense attorneys have called multiple witnesses saying the gunman's biological mother used drugs and alcohol while pregnant and that his adoptive mother was not responsive to his cries for help. On Friday, a behavior health case manager took the stand who worked with the gunman's family. She says his adoptive mother, Linda Cruz, was scared in her own home. During the time that you were providing services to the Cruz family, did you ever learn that Linda was ever fearful in her own home? Yes. And did you learn that from her? From her. And do you know what it was that she was afraid of? Mostly her personal belongings getting, be, becoming missing. Because I do recall her walking around with her purse all the time um, because she thought that the boys would take things from her. Also on Friday, Broward County officials announced a 29-year-old man faces multiple charges after leaving dead animals on a memorial for those killed in the Parkland school shooting. Officials say 29-year-old Robert Mondragon is being held without bond on multiple charges, including removing or disfiguring a tumor monument. Between July 20th and 31st, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas employees found a dead duck raccoon and possum on top of the monument. One of the animals had been mutilated. Investigators say they used surveillance video to track down Mondragon, who later told them he, quote, likes the metal and blood smell that emit from the dead animal, end quote. Broward County officials also say Mondragon has a disturbing fascination with school shootings, as they found text messages and internet searches about school shootings in his history. Okay, joining us today is my co-host, Terry Austin, and criminal defense attorney, Jack Rice. Jack, I want to start with you. Let's start with that Broward County arrest for placing dead animals on the Parkland shooting memorial. Is it possible officials just prevented another school shooting? Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, when we look at school shootings like this, we always end up seeing outrage, sort of an odd combination of outrage, apathy sometimes, and what you really get is you get those who are copycats. That's always the fear, is what you may get are those that are springing up based upon what they're seeing from others. In fact, you can think about Nicholas Cruz himself. Even in the videotapes he is actually having of himself back in 2018, saying, I am going to become the next school shooter. That's always the fear that you're going to drive people like somebody else with mental illness, with limited capacity to actually come out and do something else. 
That is a very, very serious problem in a case like this. And it really highlights just how important it is to watch this issue and watch how people respond to it, just like Mondragon did. And Terry, what can we take away from the behavioral health case manager's testimony? We know the defendant's adoptive mother was scared to be in the home with him, but also resisted getting him better help. Well, you know, that case manager really was on the stand for quite some time. And she talked about she visited the home at least once a week, at least in the beginning. But she tried to make it seem as though Zach bullied Nick. She tried to make it seem as though Nick was not as violent as we know he has been, obviously. And she did say that Linda was afraid of the boys and mainly afraid that they would steal from her. The fact that she had to carry her purse around and sleep with it really makes you understand that she's dealing with some serious issues. She may be overwhelmed. And I think the case manager was also trying to say, look, we tried to help her. She took some of our advice, but not all of our advice. So they're kind of pointing the finger at Tiffany Forrest, or rather at Linda Cruz, and they're basically saying she didn't take all of their advice. Thank you, Jack and Terry. And still ahead on the Law & Crime Daily, jurors hear from the defendant's former neighbor, who has conflicting testimony between direct and cross-examination. But first, the defense narrows in on the gunman's emotional and educational shortcomings. Hear from the defendant's middle school principal. Okay, welcome back. And defense attorneys moved for a mistrial Thursday morning in the Parkland school shooter death penalty case, arguing over evidence introducing Nazi symbols. So in essence, you've now ruled on the state's SF-202 motion that they filed after the jury was sworn, admitting the swastikas into evidence. So at this time, I need to make the following record and the defense will be moving for a mistrial. They cannot complain that they did not know that swastika could be a, a part of this, of this case. They, whatever decision they made, that was their strategy. The point is this, the defense is now put in a position, because we were not able to more dire on this issue, that we are forced to introduce very inflammatory prejudicial evidence against our own client. As far as this, what I would call an anticipatory mistrial, as to evidence that may or may not come in on cross-examination or evidence that you have a choice of whether or not you can put in or through a witness that you have a choice as to whether or not you can call is disingenuous. It's denied. Your motion for mistrial is denied. Testimony continued through the rest of the day. It ended with a former principal of West Glades Middle School where the defendant attended. He testified the shooter was a much more needy kid than any other he had ever seen. After Nicholas left for Cross Creek, were you aware that he was partially mainstreamed to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? Um, I may have heard about it. I think it occurred the last year that I was the principal in 2016, maybe. And would you have supported that decision? No, I would not have. And why? Because there's, there's no way, if a school of 1600 are having challenges in, in maintaining and assisting a kid a student to be successful, a school of 3,000 is going to be that much more difficult. Okay. Do you know any administrators at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? Yes, I do. Did you have any contact with any of them when he was No, I was did not. There? Okay. Do you wish you had? I feel very guilty about it. Okay, let's bring in Terry and Jack. Terry, let's break down that motion for a mistrial earlier in the week. Did the defense's argument hold any weight, and did that judge make the right decision? I think the argument held no weight, and I think the judge made the right decision, although I think she should have ruled on that motion earlier. Basically, the defense got up and said, look, judge, you abuse your discretion. It's always bad when you start off an argument attacking the judge. And basically, what they were trying to claim is that their constitutional rights were not met and that they were denied due process, they were denied equal protection, they were denied a fair trial. And the judge said, no, that's not the case. We have to hear the testimony. You heard her say it's an anticipatory mistrial. She thought they were disingenuous. 
harsh words, denied the motion, right thing to do. But she should have done it earlier because she would have avoided a motion for a mistrial altogether. Okay, and Jack, as for the middle school principal's testimony, he saw the gunsman's emotional and educational difficulties, but he did not discuss these issues with staff at the high school. Could he be liable in any way? Well, I think in the end it's likely not. But I think what this is really about from a defense perspective is this, is what they have been doing for the last two weeks now is establishing a couple of things. He was a broken kid at two, three, four, five, six. All of that was true. And they had a lot of individual testimony from those who were very up close and personal who could describe that. That means something. But then what they've also done is they've dovetailed that with multiple opportunities from the so-called experts, whether they were uh, intellectual, whether or not they were academic, whatever it was, where they failed. And in this particular case, what we're really talking about is we're talking about a middle school principal who should have stepped in and said, you can't mainstream somebody that, that's this broken in the first place. And they turned around and they did it anyway. And this was one example of a whole bunch of them. So you can turn around and say, it was broken in the first place, but everybody who was in a better position to do something about it didn't bother or didn't worry about it or did nothing. And now we turn around and, and put it in the lap of a broken kid, a broken young man. And we say, it's his fault? I mean, come on. I think there is some power that came in with that. Thank you, Jack and Terry. And coming up on the Law and Crime Daily, blood painted on the gunman's jail cell walls and graphic drawings of the school shooting what the defendant drew before his penalty phase began. Plus, conflicting testimony on direct and cross-examination by the gunman's former neighbor. Welcome back. The defense case in the penalty phase trial of the Parkland school shooter included testimony this week from the defendant's former neighbor. He said he was horrified by the shooting, but testified on direct and cross that after the incident, he still talked to the shooter in jail. You've um, had conversations with the defendant while he's been in jail, correct? He's called me a few times. You consider him to be a friend, don't you? I would consider him to be somebody that was in my life for a short time, who I tried to give some assistance to and tried to help. I considered him a friend till the incident happened. Uh, then I, 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 had, I, I couldn't have stronger feelings of, of, of hatred and animosity. I don't think I've ever disliked anybody more. And as time went by, I just felt that he suffered from, you know, mental illness that no, no normal, rational human being Your Honor, could ever do you. anything like this. When he speaks to you, does he seem coherent and logical? He does. Okay, let's break this down. Jack, I'm going to start with you. As a defense witness, how did Paul Gold hold up on direct examination? Well, let's talk about the direct examination. Actually, I think he did quite well because he articulated a couple of things. He, he articulated how Nicholas Cruz would do horrible things and then all of a sudden shift and almost with surprise uh, realize what it was that he has done. And I think the benefit to that is what it really showed was a disassociative state, the idea that he would be shocked himself by what was actually happening. And that was really, really useful. I actually thought he came across as extraordinarily credible when it came to this issue. The, the, the cross was a little different, but, but from a direct perspective, I thought they sort of scored the points they were hoping to score. Okay, Terry, and now on the other side of that courtroom, how did Gold hold up on cross-examination? What do you think the jury made of all of the cross and the testimony? Well, Jack is absolutely right. That cross-examination was very different from the direct. I do think the prosecution made some points here. He was trying to show inconsistencies. First, Paul Gold said that Linda had not gotten the defendant help, but he didn't know that she had gotten him help since the age of three. And on the one hand, Paul Gold is saying that, you know, she's overprotective, and yet he's trying to say that the kids are starving. She basically is being attacked from every one of the witnesses that have gotten onto that stand. So the worst was the movie, though, the fact that they talked on that telephone about 
producing a movie, and that wasn't good. It showed that he is biased. Thank you, Terry and Jack. And when we come back, a look inside the mind of the Parkland school shooter. We show you the disturbing drawings and explicit writings the gunman made ahead of the penalty phase trial.